Greetings and welcome back to another edition of McTown Talks. I'm here with the now well-known Adam Jensen to be talking about his area of uh, expertise, in fact, which is aging science and aging research. We're going to be covering the length and breadth of the topic, I should hope. And by the end of it, I hope everyone has a better idea of what aging actually means, particularly in humans, and what the contributing factors are, and you know, what could possibly be done. But before we get into that, there probably is a decent reason why Adam Jensen chose uh, gen- genetics, and more specifically, aging research and the, the genetics of aging, as opposed to, I don't know, electrical engineering or... <laughs> or in organic chemistry. So what you originally started with neuroscience and you decided to, I guess, branch off. I mean, they're somewhat distantly related, but branch off into a new field to in your uh, post-grad or sorry, American graduate studies. So what motivated you get you motivated you to get into aging research and aging science? Well, thanks again for having me on Stardusk. Um, the reason why I got into aging research was a bit of a uh, random circumstance. I uh, was looking into laboratories to start doing my re- doing uh, extracurricular research uh, while I was an, an undergrad, and I happened upon an aging lab. And I'd been interested from a just educated layperson standpoint in the topic, but the opportunity to both do aging research and potentially contribute um, while uh, conducting my undergraduate education in neuroscience allowed me to uh, fulfill that, that desire that I wanted. And so I ended up staying with that lab for about four years, the entirety of my uh, stay at my undergraduate. And I decided that this was certainly the field for me. Um, And that, and who doesn't want to live forever? Right, so maybe you can talk a little bit more about that motivation, because I think it's pretty interesting. Ah, so, yes. Um, Well, I mean... Aside from being an augmented human being with a drastically enhanced lifespan, um, there is one important aspect about, say, the future of medicine. There's lots of talk about um, replacing organs, replacing, um, like, treating the human body as if there were a car, which it very much the analogy holds. Um, when things break down, you could and can very easily replace uh, the broken parts. Uh, Heart transplants are still a difficult process, but they are fairly common. Uh, Kidney transplants, Mm. lung transplants. The thing is, though, the reason why I was both interested in neuroscience and aging uh, was that you can't do a brain transplant. And if you And so I was interested in looking into, well, okay, if I can't do that, at least not within the short term, with this fairly explosive growth in in development of uh, stem cell biology, organ development, and whatnot, I wanted to see, okay, how can I, at the very least, find ways into slowing down aging within the brain? And so those two topics sort of just connected well yeah. and complemented the science. Yeah, I suppose by by brain transfer, what you really mean is essentially consciousness transference. Effectively, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I think one thing before we get into the, the details, the nitty-gritty, that a lot of people uh, just sort of accept as par for the course, and I mean, by and large, because throughout our own history, human history, it's just that was just the way it was, is that there's an inevitability uh, to aging that it's, in fact, not a, not an illness, not something wrong. So there's nothing wrong with, well, I've been degenerating rapidly since my late 20s, and 
I'm much more degenerate in that regard than you are being young, you being young, that that that's just, you know, normal. Uh, and I suppose that's one perspective. It's normal in as much it happens as to every uh, human, every mammal. But the idea that it shouldn't be addressed as an illness and even opposed to some degree, that strikes me as particularly novel, not only in your approach, but the fact that increasingly we see uh, numbers of scientists and scientific research that really are interested in, in, at the very least, halting it, slowing it down, and perhaps even reversing it. Yeah, I believe the argument against it being a, a treatable or something that is not normal uh, originated either from Aristotle, Plato, or Socrates. One of the three made the argument that because this disease is something that afflicts all, it therefore cannot be a disease. Um, and that's kind of the mindset that's followed us to this day. Um, when in reality, that does not have to be the case. Um, there are several examples. Um, well, in we'll, we'll get into that. I mean, we'll, we will get into that. Especially when we compare uh, classes of animals. Um, yes, absolutely. We'll find out that uh, aging is, is rather uniquely the province, the unfortunate province of, of birds and mammals. But uh, your uh, friend, the Nile crocodile, for example, doesn't necessarily have to operate under those same conditions, just as an example. But So let's get started with the, the science. So if we were to define aging... What is aging I, I, in a scientific, physiological sense? How would you define it? So strictly involving all organisms, the general definition would be um, a progressive loss of function, including fertility, and increasing mortality with advancing, advancing age. And that's just the general one. But when it comes to humans, uh, Dr. Richard Miller... Uh, he's the professor of pathology, and he is a director of a Nathan Schock Center on Excellence in Aging Research at the University of Michigan. Um, he gave a talk, and he described human aging as a process that progressively converts healthy young adults into less healthy older adults with a progressively increasing risk of illness, injury, and death. And so with those two, with those two uh, definitions, we have a fairly good idea of, well, this increasing risk, it's observable. And we can see this from the data that we'll get into. Right. And, and under this, uh, in this light, it's safe to say that aging is effectively a degenerative disease. I mean, obviously in the details, not the same thing as I say multiple sclerosis, but it has that in common with other degenerative diseases in as much as over time, your functions, well, in this case, your entirety of your body, uh, you know, your muscle mass, the, the efficiency of your liver, all of these things just get worse over time. So it's a degenerative disease. Right. And, and from person to person, uh, people can slow, uh, can age at different rates. Right. And so the reason why some people will die of heart disease, while well, most people in the United States will die of heart disease versus, say, cancer as the second cause, um, really just depends on which uh, aspect of their physiology and biology and biochemistry fails first. Right. So, I mean, part of that is obviously well, massively so. The genes and alleles are responsible for some people aging more quickly than others. And, of course, there are obviously, unless someone called me, some sort of genetic determinist environmental factors. I mean, if you're if you're putting back, say, two packs a day for 25 years, I, I would almost assume beyond the obvious normal health risks that uh, you, you already see with the way smokers look. They tend to look more aged, uh, older. It does, yes. And so there are obviously environmental factors as well. But <clears throat> that said, you get these quirky cases. And I, I recall one random one, some ancient woman in France who I think she died 110 or something, who did smoke a pack every day for something like 70 years. Yes. So that, at least to me, would point more heavily in the way of genetics being the primary factor. Right. And one of the initial findings that was established with these, um, the term is uh, centenarians, or people who have lived past the age of 100. Hmm. Um, 
from a genetic perspective, early uh, research has shown that they tend to have longer telomeres, which are these little uh, snips of, yeah. Uh, But just to quickly define them, there are these little snips of uh, DNA at the end of chromosomes that get chopped away with every replication um, and have, and they tend to have longer telomeres than the general population. Um, Outside of that, behaviorally wise, um, the only uh, anecdotal um, behavioral traits that I've seen amongst them is that they tend to eat bacon and smoke cigarettes. (laughs) Yeah, traditionally in light of, well, certainly the the cigarette smoking is still well established to be not good for you, but but the the bacon is a a little bit more controversial, at least disputed in, in light of a lot of the new evidence on saturated fat and what have you. But yeah, I mean... It just goes to show how effective that genetics can be uh, and the humans in a long-lived human in resisting the damage that they cause to themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are the lucky ones. It's yeah. certainly a, a minority. Generally speaking, if you're you know, putting back, as I said, you know, two packs a day for 25 years, it's, it's best not to play Russian roulette, which is to say you know, maybe you lucked out and won the genetic lottery and smoking empowers you, but most of us don't have that, uh, that opportunity. Indeed. Indeed. And, um, there is one other thing. Uh, there's a misconception about aging research that I get when I discuss it with people outside of the field, even within medicine and biology, but not necessarily in aging research. And, that's about effectively them thinking I'm trying to make their grandmother stuck in the, uh, what is it, the nursing home for an extra 10 years miserable as a geriatric, which is not the case. Um, so we, biogerontologists or geroscientists with gero or geron being the Greek word for old, What we try to research is means of making people live longer in the sense that when you are, say, in your 20s, it's the equivalent of having an additional 10 years of 20-year-old youth. Mm. And so it's difficult, if not impossible, to make grandma in the um, nursing home live an extra 10 years because at that point um, the damage has been done the damage has been done although there is uh, some additional uh, rejuvenative uh, research that has been done that uh, that we can mention later Mm. yeah so i think the idea to take away here is that ideally aging research uh, gerund biological research it should be thought of as, in as much as is possible, reversal or maintenance rather than than prolonging a, a particularly sickly condition or degenerative con- condition that uh, is unpleasant to everyone. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If one, because that's what people want, and two, uh, simply out of practicality, it's just very difficult to keep someone who's sickly alive longer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of the basis of aging and aging research and the goals. So why should people give a damn about this? I mean, uh, throughout history, people have accepted death as inevitability, aging and degeneration. Uh, You know, I've kind of accepted it. Uh, I noticed tremendous differences in my metabolism, my physiology between now and say 15 years ago. So but, you know, what can I do about it? So why should people actually care about this particular branch of scientific research more so even than some others? So there is a lot of research poured into specific causes of death, such as the top 10 causes of death, first being heart disease and second being cancer. Um, and so the thing is... Um, Nine out of 10 of the top causes of death per year, at least in the United States, 
are directly attributable to aging, as in for nine out of 10 of these um, causes of death, the, the risk of getting, say, heart disease, a heart attack, um, cancer that, of various types that would eventually kill you, or uh, a, a respiratory disease, or stroke, or, or Alzheimer's, all of these things spike in risk every five years as you get older. And so if we can slow down the aging process, then not only can we reduce the overall risk that people face in developing these, these disorders, because I doubt anybody wants to experience a heart attack or experience a stroke or Alzheimer's. Um, but in addition, it could save us trillions of dollars. So in the U.S. alone, in 2000, at least uh, in 2010, um, and we do have a, uh, we do spend the most, but... Um, we as in the United States. Yeah, the United States, yes. Uh, medical expenses cost about... 18% of our GDP of the country's GDP and it's increasing and that's in 2010 mm -hmm. with people over the age of 65 so people who are seeing the significant aspects of aging paying 1.2 trillion dollars a year to treat these conditions and so simple aging treatment such as um, the effects of caloric restriction so one of the established uh, aging treatments that everybody and your uncle knows is that if you restrict calories, you live longer. Yeah, and I, if, I, it's funny, though, because I don't think everyone and your uncle knows this. I mean, the fasting, uh, it is, it, in as much as it's a tool for a variety of things, particularly for aging, we should talk more about this, but... I, I, I would venture to guess that it's still not accepted as uh, maybe particularly in since scientific and mainstream as I, something that's related to to aging and lifespan. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're right. Um, I, I guess the most well known in, right. relative, yeah, the most well known aging treatment, uh, caloric restriction or just extreme dieting. Hmm. Um, so to put it in perspective. Which is uh, which is itself contingent on on macronutrient composition to some extent. Yes, should absolutely. point out if you're just if you're eating a thousand calories of sugar cane a day, probably not the solution. It's not going to work out well for you. So just to put things in perspective, um, again referring back to uh, Dr. Richard Miller, uh, he reported on some research in which using an example uh, average. Uh, 50 year old person if we cured every type of cancer today um, that average individual would expect to live an extra 2.6 years so from 81 years old to 83.6 years old and if we cured heart disease today um, that alone would only add about 2.7 years to life expectancy, and both would be about six, so you'd leave to, live to 87. Um, and so what you see is just just this bumping into well, okay, the first there's the first cause, and then the second cause, and then the third cause. You just keep on bumping into the next age-related cause of death. But the thing is, with this caloric restriction that I had mentioned, just that. Um, has three to five times the life expectancy of both curing cancer and heart disease combined. Your life expectancy as someone who is 50 today would go from 81 to somewhere between 110 to 120 years of life expectancy. Now, we, sh we should be specific about caloric restriction because it strikes me as some fundamental problems. Being in a perpetual caloric deficit it's not only very difficult, uh, but 
when, when, when scientists speak of caloric restriction in the context of aging, do they mean a very slight one? I mean, let's be specific about this, because I think it's important. I mean, everyone, most people here have done diets, some for longer than others, and being in long-term caloric restriction, it's difficult, it's, you know, you're irritated, all of these things. So what, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about caloric restriction, other than the obvious? Generally in mammals, it means 20% uh, less calories than needed for maintenance right. weight. So for example, if you're an individual, uh, if you follow, uh, say that 2000 calorie or kilocalorie as it should be called, uh, prescription for daily diet, the caloric restriction would be 1600 calories a day right. as opposed to 2000. I think a lot of people would struggle with that though, to be frank. Right. And, th and th this is understood in, in the field of aging research, which is why we don't focus on how do we convince people to not eat or to eat 400 calories less a day and focus more on how do we like what causes this? Like, why is it that caloric restriction extends lifespan? We don't want to just stop at, oh, well, we should definitely talk longer. about that. But it, it is a, a fascinating, it's somewhat tangential, but a fascinating aspect of human psychology. It, something re rather well known, we know has a much more profound effect on aging than, say, even curing cancer or heart disease. And yet, because of the nature of human psychology, it's, it's almost certain we couldn't get a majority of people to, on a permanent or semi-permanent basis, drop their calories by 20% daily or perhaps maybe weekly since that probably is a better uh, estimation. Uh, that just doesn't seem feasible because of human nature. For all the reasons that have been talked about prior, you look at things like obesity rates, ability to maintain weight loss, all these things. Um, it's, it's really strange. It strikes me though also as something that with the right medication uh, could actually be implemented which is to say some, some medication that would uh, appetite suppressants or things of that nature. And it's not even just appetite suppressants. It's, it's medications that would directly target the pathway that causes this aging extension, this, this uh, youthfulness maintenance without... You're effectively tricking your, your body. You're tricking the body of model organisms into thinking that they're undergoing caloric restriction without undergoing caloric restriction. So you're tricking yourself into, your, into thinking you're dieting, but you're not. You're just taking a pill or you're just receiving a treatment. Right. Now, as, as to the reasons, I've thought about this quite a bit myself. And as we'll discover soon, aging, to, and is, biological aging, is related to, uh, to reproduction in birds, birds and mammals. My understanding is such that when you engage in long-term caloric restriction, uh, the body, I talk about tricking, you're sort of tricking your body in, in modernity. This is, of course, ridiculous. You're not actually starving, but into thinking, right. well, we need to you know, postpone reproduction. Therefore, we need to maintain the system at an optimum, as, or at least best as possible, in order for the time that later on when we do, in fact, reproduce and then begin to de degenerate. But, um, it, you know, this is anecdotal, but... There are all sorts of reasons why parents, for example, look ragged and tired and, and aged and, and wizened. But mm -hmm. it, it's this seems like a nigh universal, barring a few exceptions, that I see people my age uh, or even younger who have reproduced who just look significantly older than I do or even just look far older than their age uh, would, would uh, intimate. So Develop wrinkles, gray hair. Yeah, I mean, the, the stress and uh, all these things. But... But certainly reproduction must have something to do with it if we take into account its relationship uh, to aging and the fact that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, your body is, is, has its best uh, intentions. It doesn't obviously have intentions, but metaphorically intentions in preserving the entire apparatus of your physiology in order for you to reproduce later uh, if you induce this long-term caloric deficit. So the interesting thing is, According to a, uh, a relatively recent paper in the journal Aging, um, 
there's a discussion about what's called alternative gerontology, and no, it has nothing to do with alternative medicine. Um, alternative gerontology is effectively this just this mindset of taking a look into the animal kingdom and seeing, okay, is aging universal? Um, do all animals experience this? Do all animals experience uh, mortality from a biological standpoint, just dying of old age? And the overwhelming answer is no. And as you had mentioned before, it's actually somewhat of a cruel joke that mammals and, and birds are effectively the odd ones out that experience aging and biological mortality. And by biological mortality, I mean um, if you are free from predators and, say, an infectious disease such as a virus. So if you are free from environmental insults, you will effectively live forever mm. as long as you're in a place with resources. And so to answer your question about the aspect of reproduction, it appears that, um, and we can further into this discussion, that one of the crucial delineators of mammals and birds from the rest of the clades that we'll mention that, exp that don't experience aging and us experiencing aging is that we have a very specific uh, reproductive strategy. Our genetic makeup actually triggers the aging process the second we reach, um, the second we reach sexual uh, maturity. And the thing is, with that, you re you reach sexual maturity no later than 18. And so, once you hit 18 as a human being, you have started aging, which is kind of odd to people, but it, you can observe this. Um, and so if uh, one potential future target, and, uh, there's been research done on this in, uh, the roundworm, uh, C. elegans, uh, the nematode, um, in which when using lasers to ablate or destroy, uh, two of the four cells necessary for developing their, uh, gonads, uh, for reproduction, it causes a drastic increase in lifespan, upwards of 20 to 40%. Mm. Yeah, I mean, barring the practical concerns, say if we were like, like crocodilians of effectively growing forever, uh, I mean, there we would have to sort of adjust to that. But yeah, it sort of becomes an arms race once you hit 18. And uh, I mean, I guess we could say oh, up to about 25, you're more or less in your prime, give or take. Uh, after that, it's just downhill. I always usually just say after 25, it's downhill. But yeah, I mean, technically, after 18, as far as actual growth, uh, it, yeah, things start to uh, fall apart. Now, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say both are correct. Uh, 25 for mental, 18 for um, 18 for just overall biological. Right, which is to say, you know, you're, you're up, but I'm, I'm talking about when you see, like, decreases in serum testosterone and things like that. Right. right. After 25 is really when it starts to kick in and just rapidly picks up and, yeah, well, welcome to the world of degeneration. Yes. Now, I've been thinking in, uh, for a while about why this is the case. I mean, there must be something going on with birds and mammals that is, is different. The only thing I could come up with is that birds and mammals tend to be the most intelligent animals, uh, more developed brains. Maybe there's some relationship there. Maybe it's a question of just energy expenditure, you know, all that energy that has to go into the, the creation, uh, maintenance of, of, say, a huge brain, a very complex brain. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just sort of throwing shots out in the dark here. But um, may, maybe it's just, it is just a cruel joke and just a, a quirk of fate. I don't know. So it, it, it really can be tied quite tightly to uh, sexual reproduction biological programs or genetic programs. Um, so, for instance, again, the friendly C. elegans, the nematode. Um, Maybe you should has, explain to the audience exactly what that organism is before we... 
So uh, C. elegans is a is a roundworm, uh, which is no longer than a millimeter in length, which has been became become a well established model organism in various fields of research for multiple reasons. Um, one, its genome has been entirely sequenced, and it's incredibly easy to do so simply because they have a very quick uh, reproduction rate. Um, so you can get large samples very quickly. You can get clonal samples very click quickly, or you can get samples of, of populations that are genetically identical because C. elegans are hermaphrodites and can self-fertilize. And so if you put one worm on, say, a uh, plate, within a few days, you'll have hundreds of clones. Um, and so that has multiple advantages in just genetics research. Uh, whereas say with like with mice, you would have to do breeding, uh, f for a long period of time in order to get the same level of populations and, uh, genetic identicality. And the thing is they are translucent. So you can very easily, it, <clears throat> you can very easily see uh, the uh, intestine of the organ or uh, organism, uh, as well as other major body parts. Um, and you can observe things like the quality of their their subcomponent makeup. You can observe that the older the worm gets, the less organized, the more disarrayed they appear. Um, allows for experiments with fluorescence. Say if you wanted to tag a protein or a gene um, with something that glows in say uh, green, which we would use uh, a green fluorescence protein. Um, due to the nature of them being translucent, it's incredibly easy to see it under very minimal magnification. And you can do this very selectively. Um, so C. elegans are an incredibly uh, useful organism for various types of research and have really found a, a strong niche in aging research for pretty much all of those reasons mentioned. Uh, and the interesting thing is these guys die in 16 days, at most 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and they only have 302 neurons. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're no birds. They're definitely no humans. So they're not intelligent. Um, they can develop memories. Yes. But it's in as simple as it can get. Uh, even jellyfish have a, a tenfold higher number of, of, uh, neurons and C. elegans, I, I believe the number is about 5,000 neurons as opposed to 302 for C. elegans. And so it's interesting that you, that you see aging and biological mortality or death from just simply being alive um, in animals that aren't intelligent, aren't really going through them. Uh, the same processes as humans, except uh, reproduction. Right. Now, as we get into why the, the theories and ideas as to why we age, and you know, some we know some and some we don't, uh, one idea I, I've observed, it's you know, somewhat related to predation. Um, I forgot the name of the species. There are some species of clam in the North Atlantic. It just uh, seems to just live forever, hundreds of years. Ocean cohog? It might be that one. In any event, um, it, it, if you don't have to deal with predation, well, well, let's look at some of the uh, short-lived uh, mammals that are often used in research, like rats and mice. Mm -hmm. um, these guys tend to live very short lives, uh, reproduce uh, in large litters, and in the wild, where they're not being kept in, in labs, I mean, different cat species, uh, predate on them, uh, coyote, you name it, you know. So it's in their interest to just become sexually mature, mature 
and reproduce as much as possible because chances are they're going to be uh, devoured or uh, chosen as a prey item. If you've got all the time in the world, um, then why bother with that scheme, you know? Yeah, and you can you can actually see this behavioral shift in humans. Um, so, for example, uh, human lifespan was about 34 years maximum during hunter-gatherer days. It went down a little bit during the Neolithic Revolution for uh, reasons I gave in a video. Um, that, but uh, after the Industrial Revolution and the increase in lifespan, uh, you start seeing people pushing off having kids to 30, which is just insane compared to what our our ancestors were ex were expecting. Twenty thousand years ago, seventeen or eighteen probably would have been the age in which you reproduced, and probably even fifteen or fourteen. Yeah. It's it's just yeah, it, it's it's it, it's it would be quite a shock to our behavioral human ancestors to see us reproducing at, at 30 and then living for an extra 47 years on average. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like when, when lifespan is extended through just basic nutrition, as we've seen with humans and, um, uh, a lack of predation as seen with both humans and, and the mice and rats that you've mentioned, um, yeah, you can see a slight shift in reproduction. Um, and there's some relationship there. I think it was CS who mentioned, we'll get into telomeres in a bit, but oh, yes. between telomere length and that, you know, it strikes me there is one, uh, one group of people, uh, the famous chavs from the UK who, they tend to carry on the hunter gatherer tradition. They, <laughs> many of them reproduce between, uh, 14, 16, in some cases even 12, and their children tend to oftentimes carry on the tradition of being very young or middle middle teenagers and reproducing. Uh, this strikes me as, well, given what we know, probably not the best, best health measure long term. No, but it goes in line with our behavior, with our instincts and our genetics. Yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I'm presuming these people are, I mean, that's another thing. Um, we observe Definitely. this. We can tie this into this general uh, phenomenon we see across the industrialized world where educated people uh, with decent income, which roughly corresponds to IQ, not always, but most of the time, most of the time tend, yeah. to, tend to hold off, hold off on reproduction and to the extent that they do engage in it, uh, have few children compared to the days of yore or, you know, some of these uh, young teenagers in these, from the socioeconomic class who you know, have two or three by the time they're, they're 21 already. And so it, it, there's a kind of similarity there, I guess, and uh, that I guess the more complex, if you will, human beings tend to, neurologically speaking, tend to be much more circumspect and, and plan uh, much more long term than, well, people who aren't as intelligent or educated. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and and wealthy as well. Um, yeah, I mean, in as much, I mean, there are a few exceptions, but in as much as wealth corresponds to intelligence, the ability to sort of make and create wealth. But yeah. Oh, and and reproduction. Just yeah. the wealthier you are, the less kids you have, even in the Islamic world. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, this seems to be sort of consistent throughout all species, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. Um, all all sexual reproductive species, yes. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, um, the animals, uh, to get back onto this notion of us being mammals and, and avians, being the odd ones out, um, it really does appear in the, in the majority of the uh, classes of animals, the the clades um, of animals that either one don't age biologically, and the term for that is senescence or non senescence. If you do not age, uh, senescence being cellular aging, um, and or 
do not experience biological mortality. They are biologically immortal. So as I had mentioned before, um, they, excluding predation and environmental insults, they can live as long as possible um, until the sun uh, explodes um, or until they get eaten. Um, you see the majority of these species in... Uh, in the ocean, uh, for example, a biologically immortal animal, so would be the hydra and some species of jellyfish. And these biologically immortal organisms, um, quite interestingly enough, you can see them switch between biological immortality and uh, a program, a genetic program that causes them to age. And the, the, the switch is, while uh, if they are reproducing asexually through budding, they are biologically immortal. However, when they switch to sexual uh, mating, which uh, several jelly, uh, species of jellyfish can choose to do, that's when you start seeing aging processes. That's when you start seeing senescence. And the thing is, they can just switch back into asexual reproduction and they'll be rejuvenated. Adam, this makes me think of, uh, I guess this is a bit science fiction, but uh, a possibility, which is to say, if, if we could somehow through genetic, chemical, hormonal manipulation, render ourselves effectively hermaphroditic, if, if this might have an effect on our own aging regime, you know? Yeah, this, that could quite possibly have a significant effect. Um, there's some morbid anecdotal evidence. Um, it's, it's more historical than anything, um, but it's uh, eunuchs, for example, in, in medieval Europe would be reported in, in classical literature as living longer. Um, and again, this is anecdotal, but it would go along with what we know in, in biological research with other model organisms. Right. Um, not that I'm advocating anybody go out and do that. That's not a good idea. You'd have to take uh, additional hormonal supplements just to stay healthy. Right. Um, but it's interesting to see that it's really the the life program that evolution has effectively uh, handed to mammals and birds as opposed to uh, reptiles and several ocean species. And humans seem to be struggling at the moment, at least these sort of, sort of well-educated, intelligent ones. I mean, they're at a point, particularly females, where they tend to postpone reproduction to the point where it actually becomes a risk, a health risk yeah. in some cases for, for offspring, you know, in terms of retardation. And I mean, it's safe to say that biologically speaking, postponing reproduction past say 35 carries with it numerous risks. Um, on the other hand, we, there is evidence to suggest, you know, having kids at 15 isn't a great idea either. Um, so uh, I guess the sweet spot might be maybe early 30s or thereabouts. I don't really know um, as far as women's reproduction is concerned. So this is jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah. Um, but so there's a paper called uh, The Nine Hallmarks uh, of Aging. Well, we, 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 we want to talk about these hallmarks of aging anyway. So why don't we just get into that? So so just to quickly uh, uh, just touch upon this this notion of uh, older women ha uh, giving birth to children with longer telomeres, but also older women having a higher risk of uh, their children having some sort of uh, abnormality, such as uh, Down syndrome. Um, one important aspect of that is uh, one of the final aspects of the aging hallmarks, which is altered uh, intercellular communication, or basically just the hormones, the, the, the proteins, the, the signaling molecules that go through your body. And 
when you get older, uh, that system is, is not uh, well maintained. And so that system is talking to the fetus. And if the fetus is, re is receiving uh, bad information or if the egg cells themselves are, are receiving bad information or the egg cells themselves are having their own problems, you're going to have a higher likelihood of developing either uh, a child that will have some sort of defect or disease or, or deficit, or you'll just experience uh, a failure to uh, reproduce. The, you'll have a stillbirth or you'll have a, um, yeah, exactly. But yes, to, to, to get to the basics um, of the hallmarks of aging, this is a paper that was published in Cell. Um, it's kind of a reference to a, uh, another paper, uh, which was very famous in, um, within the uh, uh, biomedical sciences called the hallmarks of cancer. Um, and so the same sort of structure has been maintained where we look at nine uh, major processes that have been divided into three uh, uh, types and uh, into a hierarchy. And so to begin, uh, we have primary hallmarks or the initial causes of aging or the damage of aging. And as a geneticist, why not start with genomic instability? Um, so again, and then those for you who um, aren't well versed in genetics, simply the genome is all of your genes. That's essentially it. So as organisms age, what we start to see is this breakdown of uh, machinery responsible for um, when cells in your body split, uh, when they replicate, uh, you still need all of your chromosomes. Um, the chromosomes that each of your cells has. And so in order to do that, your cells duplicate your chromosomes prior to uh, making a copy so that each cell has the correct number. Um, I just mentioned Down syndrome, uh, which is trisomy 23, or an, uh, an example where you have three chromosomes instead of two. Uh, and that causes a disease, Down syndrome. Um, and so with every cell in, in, uh, in, in your body outside of reproduction, you have two sets of chromosomes, or two copies of each chromosome. That, uh, that, and you need to be able to duplicate them, and once duplicate them, separate them equally. And so when you age, the, the mechanisms that do that separation, they fail to do so. So what you'll have is, for example, um, you'll have one cell that has, that's trying to divide. So it starts off with the 46 chromosomes that human ha humans have, doubles it to, to uh, uh, 92. And when it splits into two cells, um, you might have one cell that has 45 and the other one that has 47, and that could cause both of those cells to fail, uh, to kill themselves. The term is apoptosis when a cell kills itself. And that's one major, or that's one significant aspect of cellular damage or uh, of genetic aging. And there's also the accumulation of mutations uh, due to just being alive and the tools that repair your DNA breaking down over time, as well as the tools that repair the DNA within um, your mitochondria. And so this just accumulates and accumulates with age. And, and early on, it's not a problem because you're young and, and you can you can replace these cells. You can these cells can be removed. 
um, and the risk of, of this happening um, doesn't necessarily is not necessarily very high at a very young age, but as you get older, it dra it drastically increases. So there's already uh, effective research on addressing this first uh, hallmark, and that is um, there are genes that check for genomic stability, and when you enhance these through various methods um, in mice, you see an increase in lifespan uh, and a decrease in risk in cancer as well. And it's a promising technique and it could very well uh, uh, see effective trial in, say, for instance, the manipulation of embryos that's being done in, in China with uh, gene editing. Yeah. Now let's move on to the next bit, which is, we've already talked about telomeres, maybe we should get in a better, uh, greater depth here. So let's talk about telomere attrition uh, and the relationship, uh, the process to telomerase and, and all of that good stuff. Certainly, certainly. So as I had mentioned before, telomeres, again, are effectively these protective caps on chromosomes that protect them during replication. They're like the, uh, if you wear sneakers or if you wear any type of shoe with a, a plastic cap on the end of the, your uh, shoelaces, that's effectively what a telomere is. It's, it's the thing that prevents the fraying, the chopping away. Um, and so every time your cells divide, every time, um, because you're growing constantly, uh, or your cells are being replaced constantly, um, what happens is that replacement process, as I had mentioned before with the uh, genome segregation and the copying of chromosomes, these telomeres get chopped away at. And so with every replication, it gets chopped more and more and more and more. And as soon as it starts hitting actual DNA that you need, genes that code for proteins that you need, uh, that's when you start seeing cellular death and, and problems. And so it's no surprise that you see that centenarians tend to have longer telomeres than uh, shorter lived humans. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is an enzyme. There is, there is a tool that cell that the cells and, uh, organisms have that main, that can maintain these, these protective caps. And this is called telomerase. And effectively what telomerase does is when the telomere gets cut down, uh, telomerase rebuilds it back up. And so in humans, it's very weakly expressed, um, especially once we hit sexual maturity. And if anything, it's, it's, it's widely disabled. However, um, using the example of an organism that is not immortal, but is, d does not show si signs of aging, can live for potentially hundreds of years, uh, the humble lobster, uh, you see telomerase expression throughout their body, high levels of telomerase. And so this could be a potential explanation as to, or a partial explanation as to why lobsters don't age, uh, whereas humans do. And so there is this uh, additional idea that, well, if you just keep on extending telomeres, well, Adam, don't you know that cancer cells also have uh, enhanced telomerase and uh, activity? And the thing is, there's not necessarily reason to be worried about that in both studies done on mice and in human cell lines. Because uh, through telomere extension, using uh, artificial telomerase injection, with mice, 
you can see rejuvenation and increase in lifespan with no increase risk in cancer for the mice. And um, two human cell lines, um, such as uh, uh, renal or, or uh, retinal uh, cells, um, when grown in a dish and treated with telomerase, they keep on uh, reproducing and, and dividing and not showing signs of aging. And they also don't show uh, any signs of becoming cancerous. And so the fact that we can get this both in a model organism and in human cell lines shows that the supplementation of telomerase through various means, such as either um, viral uh, transmission or whatnot, uh, might not only uh, extend lifespan uh, in humans, but do so with no risk of cancer, no risk of increasing, uh, no increasing risk of cancer, which is incredibly promising. Okay. And there are a few others uh, as far as uh, primary hallmarks, um, the uh, epigenetic effects, the, the environment. Clearly, being exposed to the environment can, we know it can alter the way your genes are expressed. Consequently, uh, this would almost certainly have an effect on aging. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so there's these interesting genes uh, that produce uh, that produce proteins called sirtuins. Um, people may have heard about drinking red wine and resveratrol, more, more likely drinking red wine, making you live longer. Um, and so an environmental aspect would be the notion that um, through the intake of of uh, things that would enhance the activity of these uh, sirtuins, these, these protective uh, tools that the cell has, you can increase lifespan. And there are several aspects of this, not simply restricted to, uh, say, red wine. And Resveratrol itself alone um, has has not panned out uh, as an effective treatment right now, um, but uh, with additional uh, research, it's been established that there are other uh, precursors and elements that rely, uh, such as a compound called NAD, which is effectively an energy currency within cells that when that is supplemented in mice, um, you see a drastic increase in lifespan. And this not only just affects, uh, this is not only a, uh, just a nutritional benefit it, or attribute, it's also changing which genes are being expressed, including the activity of telomerase in humans. Mm. Um, so, it's possible that resveratrol, the reason why it did not pan out as well as it as people had hoped, um, is that it was limited by the lack of this other supplement uh, or this other compound in the body, NAD. And um, yeah, so there are, there are various there are various aspects of things that can affect how genes are expressed. Because not all of your genes are expressed, and as you go through it, your lifespan, um, parts the genes that are expressed when you are younger are not the same genes that are expressed when you're older, and that's due to them being turned on and off. And finally, as far as major hallmarks, uh, proteostasis. So proteostasis, to define it, is the regulation of protein production action and recycling and as animals age this process gets disrupted uh, for example there's alzheimer's um, and alzheimer's uh, the current understanding is that it's heavily related to the buildup of misfolded proteins called amyloid beta plaques um, 
this is also related to autophagy uh, in the sense that the uh, one of the quote unquote garbage bags of the cells, uh, the things that go around and eat up uh, misfolded proteins um, that can be induced by intermittent fasting. Um, this, uh, these autophagosomes, uh, the, the subcomponents that pr conduct this behavior, they themselves slow down. Uh, they start to fail and they start to uh, not be able to recycle these, these types of problematic uh, proteins. And you can enhance the, uh, another class of these quote unquote garbage disposal or incinerator uh, organelles, uh, the subcomponents, and through enhancing lysosomes. Uh, these are the, again, like the incinerators of the cell. Um, and there are several treatments that have already been conducted in mice. Uh, showing that by simply enhancing lysosome activity and by effect autophagy, um, simply through various drug treatments, in both mice, C. elegans, and human cultured cells, you see a drastic increase in lifespan and in just uh, the observed biological health of these cells. And so... These four things that I've uh, that I, that we've covered: the genomic instability, the telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, and the loss of proteostasis. These are all causes of aging damage, but aren't necessarily um, the end product. So there is a response to this sort of damage um, because. Uh, in and of themselves, all those things, uh, if it were simply just that, um, would, it would not necessarily be a problem because the long-lived organisms, um, such as uh, the cohog, uh, ocean cohog, clam, hydra, etc., they experience all those things as well. Um, it's just that they know they can respond to it better. Um, so... The second out of the, th the three aspects of aging is what's referred to as um, antagon uh, antagonistic hallmarks or responses to damage. And the first of these is something that directly relates to caloric restriction called uh, deregulated nutrient sensing. So... Much like you had mentioned before, Stardusk, uh, if you were to do this whole caloric restriction, but you were to do it by eating 1,000 calories of pure cane sugar a day, you'd have a bad time. And there's a reason for this. Um, so sugar is regulated within the body or responded to within the body through insulin. Um, and insulin sensitivity and protein digestion um, with age, decline. Um, and this leads to diabetes and higher risks of cancer. So, in addition, you have growth hormone, which aside from making you grow when you're young, is actually quite important in cellular and organ maintenance and repair, and it declines with age. And also, um, if you don't get, say, uh, it, it's actually released when you are sleeping and experiencing deep sleep. So doing all-nighters and things like that, you're effectively robbing yourself of maintenance and repair of your own body. Hmm. So there is caloric restriction, but again, as we've discussed, nobody wants to do that. I don't want to do that. It's no fun. Well, you did do that for a while this year. Um, are you back to maintenance now? or? Yeah, yeah, back to the maintenance. Yeah. I mean, it, there, and the, the problem, there are other problems I see with that too long term. So let's say, you know, this was just everyone's is just 
um, you get uh, less uh, less efficient thyroid function. So mm-hmm. you go go from T3 to T4. There are there are other side effects. I mean, a long term deficit. Uh, it, it's kind. Of, it seems to me one of the sort of the paradoxes of of aging research, just in general, that you know, being in a, maybe a way around that is is uh, to be very just balance it out during the week and then choose certain days, um, as well as things like you mentioned, like autophagy, which which you know, given a sufficient span of of time between when you're eating, can uh, can take effect, but. Yeah, I mean, given the problems people have with nutrition and eating, uh, this seems to be as simple, probably in the, the simplest to implement and yet the most difficult for completely different reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, if only if only food weren't so sparse when we were around 100 to 200,000 years ago or yeah, showed if up. Only one of my great addictions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the thing is, um, in response to this whole paradox, uh, the reason why it's, say, 20% caloric restriction and not, like, down to, like, 50%, if you go too low, um, as you had mentioned, yeah, you, you do get thyroid issues. You get, like, you you would start actually... It's not just too low. It's, just, it's, the, it's the prolonged... If you're just doing it for weeks and months and months, I mean, you're... Your body tries to compensate by, uh, like I said, you know, decreased uh, thyroid activity. Um, you, your testosterone levels decrease. It's just, you know, there are lots of side effects. Nothing fatal per se, but kind of suboptimal. You, you'll, you, you will live longer. You'll have less diseases, um, but you're not going to feel very great at the same time. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of the issue. So that's the reason why. Uh, gerontologists such as myself are looking for ways to trigger the same mechanism uh, without necessarily having to cause nutrient deprivation. And so we actually already have treatments that work this way. Um, There's uh, several drugs uh, such as rapamycin, which is a Actually, uh, an immune suppressant used for uh, tr- uh, people receiving a transplant in order to prevent transplant uh, rejection by the, the uh, person's immune system. And metformin, a, a, a diabetes drug that was developed in 1930s, um, both of which, rapamycin more so, but uh, re- both of which show strong and very consistent evidence throughout model organisms of being effective treatments. And there's even some anecdotal evidence through humans who take metformin of living slightly longer than uh, individuals who do not, who take different diabetic medications. Hmm. Now, there, uh, as far as other responses are concerned, there are a few others. So mitochondrial dysfunction, when we talk about that. So mitochondria, um, if uh, people uh, aren't as well versed, there's a, a quick analogy for it. They're effectively the powerhouses of the cell. They produce energy currency, like um, ATP is effectively an energy currency. Um, but in order to produce the energy that the cell needs, there are some externalities, um, much like the power plant, uh, in the, uh, early days of the industrial revolution, uh, and to this day, uh, shooting out soot into the uh, atmosphere and, and carbon dioxide, uh, our individual cellular powerhouses produce what's called a reactive oxygen species. Um, So when people hear about antioxidants, uh, these are the oxidants. The oxidants that can cause damage, but actually, um, initially, are actually useful. Um, So these uh, oxidants 
are actually a warning signal to the rest of the cell being released by the mitochondria saying, hey, something's going wrong here. And so this causes the cells to release repair proteins and repair tools to fix whatever issues that they're facing. The problem is um, when you do get older, uh, you these mitochondria produce more and more uh, oxidants. And the initial beneficial aspects of having these oxidants around turn paradoxically now become uh, one of the causes of cell death uh, as they produce too much for the cells to handle. Um, and so, again, there's already effective treatments that have been developed, uh, at least in mice. And, in, in, um, and what that's called is uh, enhanced mitophagy or the aut autophagy or the eating of damaged mitochondria and as well as the oxidant responding uh, proteins the sirtuins that i had mentioned before um, they're the ones that res that hear this oxidant alarm bell and go and uh, produce uh, cell repair and cell enhancement es essentially Yeah, and finally, cellular senescence. Ah, so this is triggered by f those first four hallmarks. Yeah. And so individual cells senescing or aging uh, can be fine and even useful, um, like senescing and dying. For example, just over the course of this conversation, um, millions of skin cells have died. Yeah. Uh, and so this is for your protection though. And the cells can reproduce and make up for this quite easily. Um, but again, like for instance, with wrinkles as a, as a very visual example, that is a sign of the re, uh, replacement rate starting to fail. So um, when more critical organs, such as uh, the heart and the brain, when the cells there start to experience senescence to a degree that can't be addressed or um, replicated or, 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 or re uh, refilled, um, you either experience cancer Whereas the cell has experienced the aging process, but has, um, instead of dying, um, it just switches to uh, a mode of, uh, of becoming a cancerous cell, sort of as a self-protection mechanism, um, because it doesn't want to die. Um, or those organs just fail. And that's when you start to see, say, Alzheimer's, uh, death from Alzheimer's or death from kidney, uh, liver disease, um, or things like that. And there are actually already, uh, uh, some papers that were published, uh, just this year, um, again in mice where through two different methods, uh, simply just killing off senescent cells in various organs alone can increase healthy lifespan. Uh, in both young and uh, old aged mice. Hmm. Now, we're getting towards the end slowly but surely, but uh, talk about integrative uh, hallmarks here. So Please. this this is the culprit of aging. This is like, these are the things that effectively when all of the things mentioned prior start happening. Um, you get two culprits, stem cell exhaustion, and as I'd mentioned before, altered intercellular communication. So to start off with stem cells, so for the few people who don't know what stem cells are, they're the cells that uh, effectively 
uh, replicate and turn into the desired cell of whatever organ they're in. So there are various types, such as embryonic. Embryonic stem cells can turn into any cell. Adult stem cells are more specialized and can, and can turn into several types of cells, um, but they're usually uh, limited to the types of cells of whatever organ they're in. So say um, in the brain, an, an adult stem cell in the brain might only be able to turn into a neuron or uh, an astrocyte uh, or some other uh, cell that you would find within the brain. Um, so the animals that I had mentioned before, such as uh, lobsters, ocean cohog clams, and the hydras, the non-senescence, and the biologically immortal animals have stem cells that appear to never get exhausted. Um, they can just keep on going. They have some mechanism that we don't fully understand that allows them to just keep reproducing, 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 and that allows them to maintain youth. Uh, unfortunately, mammals and birds don't have this trait. So stem cells age with the rest of the body because of all these problems that I had mentioned before. And because these stem cells are necessary for re uh, replacing and keeping the quality of your organs up to operating uh, uh, the, uh, the level of quality needed for operation, uh, their failure effectively means organ death and then human death. So this is another area where telomerase has, has been shown to lengthen the life, uh, lifespan of stem cells and can be used oh and um people may have heard of these cells called induced pluripotent stem cells where effectively a person um a uh, a doctor can take a sample of your skin cells and turn them into any type of stem cell that's needed say let's say you have uh degradation of your liver you could take a sample of your skin turn it into a liver's adult stem cell and use it to replace the failing stem cells in your liver and this also could be an effective treatment for extending life life and health span so the healthiness of the individual the enjoyability of their life the quality of their life and this final one, the altered intercellular communication. So again, the communication between both close and, uh, and far away cells. So cells within your brain talking to um, cells within your liver, your, your kidney, um, et cetera, et cetera, or your heart. Um, the signals that are sent between cells um, are disrupted too much signal too little signal or the wrong signal can be sent as these the organs sending the cells start to fail so you can see this decrease in testosterone for example with men as they age um, and that can cause various problems um, and it can cause inflammation, such as in the heart, uh, which can lead to heart, uh, heart attack and heart disease. And so um, in order to address this, there's this quite promising uh, research study that already has a uh, clinical trial in humans as a result in which using uh, blood from young mice and putting it into old mice causes almost entire body rejuvenation. So you see uh, these old mice having more youthful muscles. They move around more. They can do more uh, laps on the, um, what is that, that the uh, wheel that they like to run on. Uh, you see, uh, and quite importantly, uh, something that I've mentioned is important to me is that you see uh, cellular rejuvenation 
just from blood donation in the brain. You see uh, the growth of new neurons, neurogenesis, uh, mm. to replace the dying ones, which is amazing. Something as simple as a blood transfusion, something that is taken for granted nowadays. Um, and so that's the reason why, why this massive discovery uh, has quickly turned into a clinical trial uh, where men under the age of 30 uh, are donating blood. And that blood is being used uh, in transfusions to Alzheimer's patients to see if it can be an effective treatment. And the benefit of this is the fact that because blood transfusions are already done all the time, you get to skip all the safety trials. And so we'll get results much quicker. Mm. And so overall, these, um, these are the proposed hallmarks of aging in us unfortunate uh, oddities in the animal kingdom. Mm. Now, I suppose we should, well, I don't, do you want to address overpopulation? I don't really think uh, that's necessarily re relevant uh, to aging per se. I, I, have, you, have you had to deal with people uh, talking about it? or? Uh, in, in my personal discussions with um, individuals that are outside of the field of aging, um, more often than I'd like, they bring up overpopulation as an issue um, in, in regards to aging research, not necessarily in regards to uh, population in general. Um, they would point um, they would point out things like, well, currently, and, and I would agree with them, that uh, currently uh, we're, our population numbers are just starting to um, plateau. Uh, the the rate of increase in the human population on the planet is starting to slow down uh, for the first time in the last 200 years, which is is pretty good. That, that means that we won't necessarily uh, drain the resources of the planet too quickly. Um, but when I mention that, say, I do aging research. Um, some people will mention that, oh, well, if you do that, then that just means we'll have more people on the planet. And that's not a good thing. Um, and the thing is, though, this has, again, been addressed before. Um, if you're living longer, um, as has been observed cult uh, across culturally, you just have less kids and those kids are healthier. And not to mention the significant amounts of money that we would save through these aging, aging treatments and the trillions of dollars, um, if anything, could potentially increase the ability of countries to afford the switches to renewable energy and increase the carrying capacity of the planet. And, of course, there's been, I guess, resistance to a lot of uh, these drugs which show potential by... Well, the FDA and and in the United States, and I, I guess you could call them those are the concern trolls of government and what have you. We talked about uh, what I don't know if we actually mentioned this publicly, but certainly the prospect, perhaps we did, of har harnessing gynocentrism uh, to oh yes essentially invest more in in aging research. I mean, everyone knows that more so than men. At least from a socioeconomic standpoint, women, women, aging is a much more important issue to women as far as reproductive success is concerned than it is to men. Um, and generally speaking, we give women everything they want. So, I suppose one way to pitch this is to say, well, look, uh, you can stay, you know, more youthful longer. I mean, most if you told. Uh, a woman who's about to just massively hit the wall at 30, hey, we can give you another 10 or 15 years. Uh, I'd imagine most women would would love the idea. And, you know, we tend to give women everything they want. So uh, what do you think about that angle for promoting 
uh, further aging research and, and sort of limiting restrictions. It, it, it's certainly uh, a promising angle. I mean, some of the largest funders of, of aging research, not um, necessarily my specific research, but aging research uh, funding comes from cosmetic, the cosmetic industry. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, antioxidant products and like creams and whatnot for skin, for combating aging of the skin, that came from like these, cos these cosmetic uh, companies, they have labs, they have very well-funded laboratories doing research uh, into how to do, uh, how to effectively slow aging in some, in some aspects. Uh, there are other uh, m tactics, other, other ways of bringing this about. And one of the things is uh, in the United States, at the very least, uh, dogs are very, very well loved. Um, and so one means of trying to bring awareness to the value of aging treatment is um, there is a group of gerontologists who have started a research trial where they um, invite people with middle-aged to older dogs to take an incredibly low dose of rapamycin, um, low enough so that it doesn't cause the the problems of the typical dose used in humans and in mice, um, to see if we can get a extension or a rejuvenative effect without the negative aspects. And this is somewhat of a marketing angle in the sense that if you can convince people, uh, most of which, uh, as a Pew study has revealed, really don't want to live longer and, and think that aging research is kind of a waste. Um, if you can show, oh, hey, this medicine actually doesn't make you geriatric for an extra 10 years, it can also make your dog happy and healthy and, and want to play. Uh, like it, it won't be, you know, moping, like it, it won't be in pain, uh, for the several years. You can shorten the duration of its, um, old age life while keeping its, its, uh, the length of its life, either the same or even slightly longer. So this is one, um, a higher research level. So jumping from mice and not necessary to directly to humans, but to a higher organism, to dogs. Uh, but also, just mm. to market it. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, it's a it's It seems strategy. to me that <clears throat> whenever it comes to science and research, in as much as it's sort of, there's always some public element, whether it's government or not. Absolutely. We need to <laughs> make it uh, appeal to emotion. You know, make women feel good about themselves. Uh, people like their dogs. It, People just can't seem to wrap their head around the idea uh, of, of, of the science itself or are really interested in the prospects of the science itself. It, it needs to some, be some combination of emotional, pragmatic reasoning on their part that actually then motivates them to endorse this sort of stuff. It's, it's kind of a shame. I mean, it, it, not, it's, I guess it's just a, it's a fortunate characteristic of most human beings that... Um, Say in order to get research done in aging, you need to you know, make women aware. Oh, you'll look good for another ten years, or some incredibly banal crap like that. But yeah. hey, you know, uh, I guess you have to work with the tools that are available. And the tools that are available are, you know, people liking puppy dogs and dogs in general, and and um, people wanting to placate women's every wish. So, but there is actually one incredibly practical reason, um, and this is actually. Uh, probably one of the most important motivations that I should have mentioned earlier. Um, we're not figuring out faster than light space travel anytime soon. Mm. I'm just, that's, that's pretty certain. Yeah. Um, and so as a result, um, if we're going to want to do extended 
uh, space travel, space travel outside of our own galaxy. Um, I mean, outside of our, even outside of our own solar system, humans are just going to need to be able to live longer. Um, yeah, barring cryostasis, but, uh, Oh, even that's a field of, uh, that would be covered under aging research. Sure. Sure. And of course that, that whole notion, well, space travel in general and getting off the planet, that, that's something I find uh, it's just really difficult to, to sell to people, no matter who they are, uh, their sex, whatever. Uh, I, I'm not really sure how you could sell this to people unless you present a sort of a life or death scenario, but that is a discussion for another time. Indeed. I think we've uh, covered most of, if uh, not everything, involved in the basics of the science of aging. I want to thank my guest, Adam Jensen, esteemed aging geneticist, Thank you. And uh, fire of rifles. <laughs> That's another esteemed position he holds. Uh, for being here and, and explaining to the audience all of this stuff. Uh, hopefully a lot of you didn't know about this and and therefore as a consequence have been somewhat uh, educated and have learned something. And if not, maybe it was a nice refresher course. But uh, yeah, and Adam Jensen now has his own channel. Uh, you've just begun that, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll be posting a link to that in the low bar. Thank you. And uh, yeah, everyone, thanks for tuning in, and we'll check you out soon. Take care. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.